So welcome everybody. Now this um, webinar is called uh, A Greener Future with a question mark because I want to discuss with you whether you are actually heading for a greener future or not. We are going to, today we're going to go through a summary of what I've been doing with some of my wonderful students. Um, we're going to look at what we can learn from observations made of the impact that COVID-19 COVID and the lockdown situation is having on conservation so that we can sort of use those observations to make better choices in the future. We're going to critically evaluate observations that have been reported in newspaper articles and use those as talking points to help us go through this session. So, as part of the introduction, bear with me, we are going to look at what is conservation because the impact of COVID-19 on conservation um, is a bit of a strange term. So conservation in its simplest form just means keeping things the same. But then environmental conservation that's not exactly what we're trying to do. We are trying to make changes. We are trying to make improvements um, to, to kind of mitigate for some of the damage that we have done to our, to our world and try to make it better for the species, um, including ourselves, to be a healthier environment, have more biodiversity and greater opportunities for the future. So what we want to do is make those changes, make those improvements. And to do that, as scientists and members of the public and everybody, we need to learn from what we can see. We need to constantly be recording and reviewing what we can see and noting how that those changes, what those changes are, what's caused those changes and how we can improve or build upon the good things and reduce the impacts of those things that aren't working quite so well as we would like. So to do this, we need to keep looking at things that have been observed. And one thing that's been observed um, since COVID started and the lockdown began was that um without so much disturbance many of the species are braving areas that they were not previously seen in so with, if we take out the humans then the wildlife seems to come back for example moles have been seen hunting above ground um to collect those worms where they would normally be doing that underground out of the sight of the humans but with the humans not being there they've been a bit braver expanding their areas of, and getting a better better um environmental impact but oyster cats have also been seen nesting on beaches that they've not been seen nesting on for many, many years because of the disturbance that humans usually cause to those areas. Sparrowhawks, stoats and deer have been seen on um, usually frequented um, trails. So they're usually being full of people, causing noise with our bright coloured clothes on, scaring those wildlife away. And they've actually come back into those areas um, and been observed because we're not causing that disturbance anymore. Um, leatherback turtles have the nest, uh, density of nests of leatherback turtles has seen a massive increase in Florida, likely due to the less disrupt disruption caused by humans not being there. So we've got these oyster catchers taking advantage of our, uh, of our uh, deserted beaches until things like this happen in the news the other day. So what would happen to those nesting birds if people return to the beaches as rapidly as this? So what impact would that have on those nests? Is it likely to have a, be more detrimental than, than if they'd never nested there in the first place? Because they've now started that nesting process. They've invested the energy in creating those nests. They may even have laid those eggs. They may have, those eggs may even have hatched. And now we're causing that disturbance. Is that a more negative impact than it would have been if we'd have not um, vacated the beaches in the first place and they'd have been pushed again to those side areas which are relatively unpopulated? So what can we learn from this? What can we do to help protect those oyster catchers in the future? So as I, as I suggested earlier, I want you to have some suggestions put into the chat. So keep putting your suggestions as we go through and hopefully we'll start to draw some of these ideas together at the end. And also, um, as lockdown reduces again, we are going to go back into these um, areas of natural beauty and the impact of our litter would again become a problem. Is that impact going to be just the general trickle that we have most summers? Or once we go out of COVID, are we going to go out in style? Are we going to impose ourselves on all these areas and cause more of an impact, more of a disturbance to these habitats once we go back? Now these species have seen a little bit more brevity and they're coming out into these areas. Are we going to have an even more detrimental impact on their survival rates if we then turn out in our drones to revisit these areas that have been recently quite quite well protected for those habitats. So again, what can we learn for this? How can we make these habitats better for these species? So other things that have been noticed 
are the impacts of a reduction in management of habitats. For example, roadside verges, which I've mentioned earlier, are very close to my heart, have been mown less frequently because council workers have been furloughed. And then because this reduction in management, more wildflowers are being allowed to flower. They're given the opportunity to produce those flowers, produce that nectar, which in turn can support wildlife such as bees, bats, butterflies, birds, and even small mammals to access those resources. If you've ever seen a goldfinch elegantly stripping the seeds of a, a dandelion head, it's absolutely beautiful to watch. So, you know, we can also have benefits of these experiences of nature. So, roadside verges produce a huge amount of our native flora, some of which are threatened species. And if we can get this right, we can have a massive impact because um, about 10% of our country is actually roads or, or um, highways or infrastructure of some sort. So if we can get the management of those better improved, then we can have a massive impact on the species and the biodiversity of those areas. So we can learn a little bit from these, these little reductions in mowing of parks and lawns and roadside verges, and even your gardens can have a big difference to pollinators. And if we allow the plants to go to seed, the seed eating birds and the other the species further up the food chain that rely on those species, to flourish. And by the way, I didn't write this newspaper article, and I can clearly see that that's not a roadside verge in the picture, but that's not my job at the moment. So we're cracking on for that. Um, further afield, um, threats to the Amazon. Um, as we know, the Amazon is a, known as the lungs of the, the world. It's vital in maintaining the O2 CO2 balance, and it's home to 33 million people and thousands and thousands of species. Now, these people and species have to learn to live together. And if something affects that balance, then it's going to have an impact on either of those. So since the pandemic hit, opportunists have taken advantage of the reduction in uh, policing and the reduction in management and rangers uh, availability to undertake forest clearance. There's been a 55% increase in deforestation since lockdown began. And illegal logging, mining and wildfires are the highest that they've ever been for 11 years. So what can we learn from that? What has caused those issues? What can we do to make those changes reduce and the impacts be um, less negative? So coronavirus also causes a crisis for other species. Mountain gorillas have been one of our few success, uh, few relatively, relatively rare success stories because we've brought them back from the brink of extinction and they're just about to becoming less threatened and we've actually got quite a success in the ability that they have become now to maintain their own populations. However, due to a largely similar genetic makeup to us, they can also catch respiratory diseases from humans. So COVID is a real threat to their survival. And so we've backed away, we've reduced the tourism, we've reduced the impact, sorry, we've reduced the uh, input that we're having to prevent, to help them to survive. So has that had a negative impact on their populations? We won't find out until we go back in. But also, people who live in the area surrounding these um, habitats um, rely on ecotourism to support their way of life, to support their um, financial situation. And they are then seeing these species as a benefit to them. They depend on this. They are a resource to keep their um, homes, to keep their jobs, to keep their money coming in. So when that revenue is cut, they are no longer seen as a, a resource. They can then turn to poaching instead um, because they then become valuable in another way. They're not valuable alive. They're more valuable either trapped to be uh, sold on as pets or for bush meat or to be sold on for other, uh, to other um, people for resources. So we've got to make sure that that impact isn't happening as well. The impact of... Um, the reduction in ecotourism isn't just uh, impacting on the gorillas. Um, there are millions of pounds of funding from this sort of activity. These types of holidays fund a multitude of conservation in in initiatives, including those for critically endangered species or habits or habitats, including the Masai Mara to coral reefs. And this lack of finance could cause some of these organisations to close, which may mean a cessation of the projects, but also due to a lack of support for the community could lead to poaching, overfishing, deforestation, collecting resources from these habitats to sell on to make money in other ways. So these are sort of the large wilder habitats, but also um, there's impact on the conservation efforts, efforts of zoos as well. So we mentioned earlier that um, it wouldn't be surprising if 
gorillas or primates caught um, coronavirus from us, but it's more surprising that a tiger has been found to exhibit symptoms of coronavirus and tested positive for coronavirus at the Bronx Zoo in, in America. Um, the tiger um, has symptoms including a dry cough and lethargy. There are similar symptoms to what we would expect as well. So this is something that we need to learn from. Our interaction with um, species is how we got it. The um, wildlife pet trade, uh, sorry, the, the, the wild um, animal markets is where we think that the coronavirus outbreak may have initiated from, but we are also now passing it back on to other species. So we need to be aware of that as we're managing habitats, which other species are we likely to um, spread this disease to. So there are other impacts on zoos as well. And zoos can't simply, after lockdown, um, for, furlough all their staff. Their staff need to be there and they need to be feeding those animals, providing food for those animals, maintaining their enclosures, medicines, et cetera, et cetera, need to still be um, given to these animals. And because of this lack of visitors coming in, those funds have been dramatically reduced. Um, London Zoo is also threatened with closure and many will be forced to close not just a loss but this isn't just a loss to the zoos themselves it's also a loss to the scientific and global conservation efforts which are funded by these zoos and organizations which in turn helps to prevent um, impacts on species further afield a local example of this is peak wildlife park um, they're having a, they had a plea for funds to help to provide enough food to support their penguins and they recently found out today that they've actually reached their target so they can actually feed their, their funds by public appeals which is very important we'll come back to that notion later on as well but it isn't all bad news for um, species living in zoos coronavirus has meant that obviously people are less frequently in zoos and in hong kong zoo after 10 years of trying the pandas have actually mated because they've been given the required privacy to do so so what can we learn from this how can we in, in, integrate that into our plans for captive breeding strategies and policies for example okay and nature doesn't just stop nature continues doing what it does and therefore we need to keep our maintenance up as well however conservation organizations include the wild power and wetland trust and the wildlife trust are facing collapse due to the lack of funding coming in from visitors to their reserves but this conservation work still needs to go on so they are dipping into their funds and taking away all those resources that have been perhaps um, sectioned off to future, for future projects. And these may impact on those future projects and whether they are likely to continue. These include projects like rewilding and reforestation. And if we're not getting on board with those, we're not achieving our targets with those, it might jeopardise our future green targets for the future now, reduction in the pollution levels and the ability to cope with the climate change issues and our targets we've got to meet for those as well. So, as I mentioned previously, the public appeals are a massive source of funding. And if we re reduce the amount of funding that we've got, those public appeals are not likely to support necessarily the species that we really, really need. The species that we we'll lease out are those that are less cute, less cuddly, less charismatic. However, um, some of those species can be vitally important and are known as keystone species for our habitats. The example in the picture here is a, a pine hoverfly, and this is a, very important in the functioning of the pine forest within Scotland. It is um, drastically rare, highly endangered, and it's becoming, and the work on that has been funded um, so that we can actually maintain that species at a population level where it can then sustain the forest that it lives in. Okay, but it's these sort of species that are less charismatic, which might be the ones that can't get the funding for, um, from crowdfunding and public, uh, public um, initiatives and therefore those are the species that might well lose out so we need to learn how we can um, reduce those impacts as well so moving on from species we're going to look now at um, pollution levels so another observation that's been made through satellites and video images here is that countries such as Spain and Italy have seen a reduction in the amount of pollution um, by up to 50 percent over the major cities and 47 percent um, in Milan, so Milan, Milan's pollution level is now 47% lower than it was in 2019. And the main reduction is in those nitrous oxide, which are highly polluting and have a large impact on climate change. But this isn't just happening in these countries, it's happening in worldwide due to lockdown, 
and the reduction in air travel, reduction in transport, reduction in traffic within our city areas, and also a reduction in the industrial activities now that people have been um, asked to not con con continue working. So we need to learn from this. How can we make sure that these positives stay there? What can we do to make sure that we uh, maintain these benefits? So we've got these cleaner cities and it's much nicer. It's just a shame that nobody's actually there to enjoy it. So what, how long is that going to last? When lockdown ends, are we going to go back to um, filling these roads with, with pollution, polluting cars? Are we going to be um, are we going to be keeping up our good practices of going everywhere on our bikes during our, our lockdown experiences? Are people's mindsets going to change so they know that they can do it? Are we going to use public transport more or are we going to use it less because of fears of catching diseases, for example, um, COVID and other um, similar respiratory diseases or just realising that actually, you know, we need to consider what, what's going on and what's happening around us. But can we actually learn from these? Can we learn that if we are not having all this pollution in our cities, what a nicer place it is, and how much of an impact our cars are making, our, you know, our movement through these towns and cities, is it essential? Could we do something else instead? What can we do to improve these things? Answers in the chat, please. Okay, so another issue that might lead to detriments in the future to our cleaner cities is that because of COVID, um, we are changing what, what our important strategies are, where our government funding is going. Pre-COVID, Manchester's pollution was higher than the legal limits, as is the case for most of the urban areas within this country and many other countries as well. But plans to reduce a clean air zone have been put on hold due to COVID. And it isn't just Manchester. In Birmingham and Leeds and Bath, those clean air zones have also been put on, put on hold, as is the zero emissions in Oxford. That's been postponed as well. So we've learned that you know, that we're having a massive impact on the pollution levels in our cities, and now we're not doing as much about it. We've postponed these changes that we have planned to make make the difference. And I think the excuses are that, well, our pollution levels are lower at the moment, so we can wait a bit before we make these changes. But should we be doing that? Should we be acting? Should we be petitioning the government to make these changes earlier now that we see how much of a difference these things do actually make? And talking about seeing how much of a difference these things actually do make, we are noticing more and more throughout COVID the benefits of nature to our mental health. And highlighted, the COVID has highlighted the importance of nature to our mental health as we flock there in our hundreds to these uh, green areas of green space um, for our designated allowance of exercise. But accessibility to these green spaces isn't equal. It's not the same for everybody. Um, should we be influencing housing policy to make these changes happen so that people have access to all these areas in new designs and new developments? Can we make sure that there is a sufficient quantity of green space for our health and well-being and the health and well-being of the city as it whole? The provision for wildlife and those opportunities for experiences of nature as well. And there is a study, a poll that's been suggested that the majority of Britons um, have seen it, uh, the importance of and the greater appreciation of green spaces since uh, COVID. That was a, a majority of 53%, which suggests to me that I haven't seen the polls, but I don't know the exact, what the other 47% either haven't noticed a change or think that it's less important, which concerns me a little bit. But 57% have, have, have had an increased awareness of the importance of um, green spaces to their mental health. So we are actually starting to make these changes make these changes in our mindsets, but can we continue this and what do we need to do to make sure that these things continue? So on the next slide, I have put these, some of these um, issues into this uh, graph table chart type thing. So the um, position is where I think that they are in terms of the, um, whether the impact is positive or negative in terms of conservation of species and the environment whether it's short term or long term. And what we want to try and do is see if we can move all of these into that top right hand column. What can we do to have a positive impact from these issues that have been from these observations that have been noticed? So, for example, how could we now that we've noticed that our clean air um, is important within our towns and cities, how can we make sure that we maintain that? We know how much of an impact the cars and the industry 
and the air, air toll is having on our pollution. What can we learn from that? How can we make this from a short-term positive impact into a long-term positive impact? Will people be encouraged to work from home more, reducing the amount of traffic that's needed? Will people take up the idea of cycling to work um, and cycling to commute from various places to, to other places? Or are we going to see a, um, a very short-term positive impact and as soon as we turn it back, go straight back to our problems. Do we need to put more effort? Now we know the impacts. Can we um, make more, sign, more, finance, uh, more sensible suggestions of how we can actually transport ourselves? Could we make those things individually, such as choosing to bike to work instead? Or does it need to be done at a, a national or an international level for these um, advance, advances in scientific research? Do we need to find fund uh, greener, cleaner cars? Do we need to fund better transport networks to allow people to get out of their cars and onto public transport instead and do we need to have more investment in the scientific research required to make these cars greener or these air travel greener can we get electric airplanes or something in the future possibly a more simple one to answer is what benefits can we have from lockdown um, and our reduction in the amount of mowing for example we are managing our ha habitat slightly different and we are seeing benefits of that. So if we know that we have to put less effort in to get a better impact for biodiversity, more flowers, more species, more interactions with nature, more opportunities to see butterflies, bees and birds, is that almost a no-brainer? Can we encourage um, the councils, etc., to stop to reduce the mowing frequency? Can we encourage that? What do we need to do ourselves? Do we need to realise that appreciation and stop complaining when it's not been mowed, could we suggest to our um, councillors, for example, that they don't mow it? Can we, you know, educate people? Can we provide money to educate people? Can we put up posters and signs to explain why we're not mowing as frequently? Is that the sort of thing that we need to do? Could that be something that we can achieve? And what about our furry friends here, the furry moles and the not quite so furry leatherback turtles? What can we learn from those species being you know, thriving when we're not there. Can we create no-go areas for humans so that these species can have opportunities to, th to thrive? Can we have sections of coast coastline that are protected just for those leatherback turtles and squash ourselves into a, another another area where we can have all the noise, the jet skis and everything else that comes along with us? Can we provide these habitats? You know, we've seen that it does work. If we get out of the way, nature comes back. Can we create areas where we are out of the way? Does that need to be, you know, how can we achieve that? Answers in the chat, please. Okay. What can we learn from these increases in poaching of rhinoceros horn, for example, when the, when the income's not coming in from ecotourism? How do we need to maintain that income? How do we need to make sure that we are protecting the, the people around these areas so that they don't see rhino horn as the best way to make a living? How can we provide jobs? And opportunities for people so that they are not in conflict with nature but working alongside it trying to promote it trying to encourage it trying to make it better to increase the ecotourism and the value that those species have when they are alive how can we do that can we um is that a thing that we can do ourselves by choosing to go on ecotourism travel we fund these organizations or does it have to be at a governmental level or an, even an international level how can we also reduce air travel? Can we do that by ourselves? Can we choose not to go in aeroplanes as often? Or does it need to be policy driven? People will just follow what, is, what they are told to do. We can do it ourselves, but we need to take that initiative and we need to make those changes. But the government also needs to look into ways to encourage people to do that. But it also needs to look into ways to make alternative modes of transport and make our transport system a lot cleaner. Um, and what can we, you know, what can we learn from um, the increased understanding of the importance of nature? How can we capitalise on that? How can we make sure that now we know how important these na natural habitats are to us, that we actually make sure that changes are positive for the future? Can we make sure that we look after our habitats better? Can we make sure that we use our parks? Can we make sure that we 
encourage our councils to do something about it for the positive or does that again have to be at a national and international level i think it's basically we've got to lead these changes ourselves to encourage the government to make those changes and also look at it on an international level okay and i think i will now move over to anybody that's got any questions thank you very much ellie uh, for this presentation um First question, you touched on the uh, impact of COVID-19 on zoos and the question is, um, yeah. have you seen the campaign that started today by Chester Zoo who are now uh, impacted and they uh, need to raise funds? I haven't seen anything about that, no. So, yeah, so, so, what is, so they are having a, um, a, a funding bid to try to increase funds for their, to support their animals. That right? um, <laughs> but um, if you haven't seen it, then probably uh, it's a good good time to try and uh, advertise it to our viewers. Uh, if yep. you are an animal lover, uh, go to Chester Zoo website and see if you can help out. Yeah, so yeah, I think there's lots of opportunities for that as well. So yeah, if you do know anybody, any of them, yeah, go on. Go on and share them and see what you can do you know making the changes yourself from either funding other organizations or making those personal changes yourself to make make the benefits yeah uh, so the next question is uh, do you think a four-day working week um yeah. or that everyone had to work from home at least one day a week would be helpful well yes i suppose if everybody works everybody commutes one fifth less then we'll have a one fifth less of pollution wouldn't we so there will be still the increased bills to pay at home, but that will be um, a lot smaller than there will be in the workplace. So yeah, if we can work from home one day a week without impacting on the industries and the financial activities, then yeah, I think that will be a benefit. Yes. Uh, the next question is, um, the government should actually listen to scientists and develop policies based on research. Could we yeah. increase, increase car taxes and provide more incentives for cycling to work? Yeah, I think I think so. But I think there also needs to be the infrastructure put, put into place as well. We need to make sure that we have suitable and safe places to ride, such as green routes, um, where possibly cyclists are not necessarily right behind the exhaust pipes of cars. We need to move those type of routes away from those roaded areas to make them safer and safer in terms of less likely to get hit by cars, but also safer in terms of the air and the oxygen content. So we need to look at the green infrastructure of our cities to make it actually a pleasant experience to um, travel to work in those situations, in those um, bikes or walking, for example. So there needs to be investment in um, green infrastructure. There needs to be investment in clean routes and safe routes, particularly routes to school and routes to work they need to be greener and cleaner and more pleasant. We need to have possibly things like increased taxes to discourage people from using cars. Um, but we also need to incentivise the use of bikes as well. So it's not just the taxing, it's also the incentivising um, and making it a better experience to use those alternative modes of transport, especially in rainy Britain as well. Um, thank you. The next question is, uh, what lessons learned should we continue post lockdown? Well, as many as possible would be the answer. I think we've got some that are easy wins that we could easily do, for example, the reduction in cutting of, of verges and the reduction of um, cutting of hedges, for example. But also we can have similar easy wins from looking at um, fencing off areas to protect habitats, keeping the areas, you know, for, for wildlife conservation that people can't necessarily interfere with quite so much. Um, so those would be the easy wins, the cost effective wins, but also we need to make sure that we invest in the long-term future um, of how important it can be to reduce the impacts of pollution. So I think that we need to ourselves focus on some of the easy ones, but also think of the longer, larger um, long-term issues as well. So I think there's got to be a mix of both. And I don't think you can necessarily prioritise one over the other. So it's going to be a tough job for somebody who has to decide which one should be done. Uh, thank you. So another question, if you were the Environment Cabinet Minister, what yeah. would you prioritise in terms of passing a new bill? So there's that tough question, isn't it, that I said I wouldn't want to answer. 
Um, I think it's, well, I, it would be a very tough question and I wouldn't really know how to answer. I think that we would have to do a bit of everything. We've really noticed the impact that our um, transport pollution is having on the environment and how much if we reduce that transport pollution, how much of an impact that makes. So that might be something that I would like to focus on. But alongside that, I would have to look at the um, increasing green infrastructure to make that a pleasant experience as well. Um, so, but I just think that we need to try and do as much as possible where we can. So anything that is possible, we need to do it. We need to think on the individual level as well. What can we ourselves do? And um, what does the government need to prioritise? Because it won't be able to fund everything. Um, so it's got to come from, basically, the um, government will be driven by who's going to vote for them. But we need to make sure that the public opinion is where the, resource, the uh, impact is going to come from. So what do we want? What do we want to achieve and how can we let the government know which is going to be beneficial? But yes, it does have to be backed up with the science as well. So at the moment, these are mainly observations. But we've got measurements of these increases in pollution. So we need to balance how much of an impact that is having because pollution is costly. So we need to make sure that we can make financial sense out of these as well. We need to say, for example, if we um, put down air pollution by this much level, it's going to take this much cost to provide the, the infrastructure for electric cars, for example, but then the whole is going to save this much to the NHS for um, less in, um, less in um, what's it called when you go into hospital? Less emissions to hospital? Less, anyway, fewer people going into hospital and um, the benefits that that will have on our financial situation there as well. So we've got to sort of try to look at how we can make it benefit to do these things in terms of um, health environment and also financial incentives as well. Thank you, Ali. Um, last question now, and it's about supporting British farmers seasonal veg and fruit. Um, what do you think about agricultural bill allowing imports which won't follow our food and environmental standards? Well, um, I don't really agree with it. I think that we're, what we should be doing is looking at improving our farmland because 75% of our country is farmland. If we can get the farming right, we're going to have a massive impact on the biodiversity and the health of our countryside. I really do think that we need to be funding farmers to uh, grow sustainably, increase their biodiversity, um, reduce their carbon footprint or offset their carbon footprint by having trees, grass verges, hedges, and also. Um, we need to be looking at the way that we produce our foods. This um, going meat free, I don't necessarily agree with, but I think we should look at the quality of our meat, where it comes from. So if we can buy British, the UK has one of the best, uh, if not the best welfare standards for our meat in the, in the country, in the world, sorry. But it also, if we can um, get that um, meat all grown sustainably and in biodiverse farms, then we have a, a really good impact on saving that um, those habitats and improving the wildlife of their countries. If we remove the farms from the countryside, then we would have a dramatic impact on our environments. We need to make sure that we are maintaining these areas properly for biodiversity, and the best people to do that might actually be these farmers if we can fund them right and educate them correctly so that they know how to do it and it's easy for them to do, and there is an advantage to them for doing that. We will have a massive impact on the biodiversity of our countryside. If we move to monocultures of um, high protein plants, for example, that's going to have a negative impact on biodiversity. So we need to make sure that we fully understand it and listen to the scientists and look at all the evidence before we make good decisions and supporting our farmers to do a really good job in terms of biodiversity in their farms is a very important aspect of what we need to be doing. Thank you. That was the last question. Uh, would you like to take this opportunity to um, advertise the Great Green Gathering? I would very much like to do that, yes. So this is just the advert for the Great Green Gathering. As I mentioned at the start, it's happening on Saturday, 10 till 2. Just click on the events page at the university, follow the link, and you'll be able to experience our free family orientated virtual talk show about little changes making a big difference to nature and biodiversity. I would just like to say thank you very much for everybody who's listened to me and thank you very much for your questions.